Hey, 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 everybody on YouTube and Zoom. Just want to welcome everybody. We'll get started here pretty soon, uh, probably within a minute. Uh, just really excited to have uh, Christian, Kristen on, and uh, we'll get started here shortly. Kristen, Christy, you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, just want to welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel. Uh, really excited to have our ADM manager for female hockey, Kristen Wright on. And she's joined us with Christy Kehoe, who's a coach for Lindenwood University. Um, so uh, Kristen, do you want to introduce, you want to set this all up or? We can do it together. Yeah, I'm happy okay. to introduce Christy. Um, I mean, Christy, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your playing career in college? All right. Uh, yeah, so um, I went to Northeastern University uh, 2007, graduated in 2011. Um, very fortunate to play a career there, especially out of California. Um, but um, yeah, it was a good time. I would like to think that I had a pretty decent career there, but I'll let Kristen, you can talk. Yeah, a little hey, bit of a uh, goal score. Yeah. Christy, I got a question. So you grew up in California. How did you yep. get started in playing hockey out there? Did you play roller hockey? What What was your whole process of getting started playing hockey out there? Yeah, so I actually got started playing roller hockey when I was about four or five. Um, I didn't actually know ice was around me until I think I was around seven and I went to a birthday party for one of my friends. Um, it was one of those on ice skating birthday parties and uh, got got on the ice and fell in love with it. And that's when I kind of made my transition into playing both roller and ice. I started playing in-house with the boys, uh, eventually started playing full time with the boys. Um, my parents actually were my family was awesome. and We made a move to help that be closer to where we wanted to be. Um, and then I actually ended up playing both girls and boys starting around 12 U. Um, I started playing on a girls team, played with boys as well, all the way through high school. I played high school boys hockey, uh, which was awesome. So I had, I, I had a little and, bit of both uh, to be able to work with. Yeah. So uh, describe some of the differences between the girls and boys hockey that you saw and how did that benefit you be, becoming the goal scorer you are, you became at Northeastern. Yeah, it, um, I, playing with the boys was one of the best things I could have done. Um, I know it's kind of one of the big controversies that's out there in women's hockey right now and girls hockey. Um, I was in an area where I didn't necessarily have a choice. So playing with the boys um, was a blessing in disguise because, man, I had to learn. I had to learn to keep my head up. I had to learn to have good vision on the ice. Um, that is, I mean, we're talking about body contact today, um, being able to use my body, protecting myself, um, that the game pace, the com competitiveness, was huge and totally essential to when I made that jump over to girls hockey, it wasn't necessarily the, the easiest. Um, but, you know, eventually as I got to that college level, um, you could kind of see everything coming together. And, um, you know, I'm definitely grateful that I had all those opportunities because it definitely shaped me into the player that I was. I was, I was used to that, um, you know, high contact because there's kind of a gap, I would say between the boys side, girls, youth hockey, and then college hockey. Um, you know, we'll even some of the clips that I'll show today, you'll see there's a lot of contact in girls hockey and even at the national and Olympic level. Um, it may not be checking, but it's pretty close to it. So, um, you know, I feel, I feel like I was really prepared for that when I got to college. Yeah, we're not checking, but it's that competitive contact that we, you know, we're going to talk Absolutely. about. I know you're going to talk about today. Um, and uh, when you were at Northeastern, um, yep. goal scoring, sniping some goals, uh, how your time at Northeastern, what was the biggest takeaway that you learned from maybe your coaches there? 
You know, I, I think the biggest thing when I grew up in California, I didn't necessarily learn a lot about systems. Um, you know, the boys team I played on, we had, you know, three to four lines consistently. Um, on the girls team that I played on, it was anywhere from 11 to 15 people, depending on who showed up that week, just because everyone was so, from so far away. Um, so we really were, we learned a lot about being creative and, um, you know, playing every position. Um, and when I got to college and we started learning more about systems, um, at first it was kind of a shock, but what I really realized was that, um, you know, even within a system, you're still all five, right? Whether you're the offensive or defensive player with possession of the puck, you know, there's still, it, the roles don't change. They're all the same. Um, so I think for me, it took a while to adjust to that, but learning uh, to play within those systems. And then, um, you know, I just think taking away like the little, the little things that coaches look for and have to say, um, you know, I know I definitely use today in the way that I teach, whether it's body contact or angling, which we'll talk about both of those today. Um, but, you know, I think that that high competitive and putting you in a situation where you need to fail, like practice was set up to be in a situation where it was pushing you and you, it, you're not necessarily seeing success every time, but you're, you're pushed to a position where you have to fail a little bit in order to see that success. That's interesting. And how did you get into coaching? Like, how did it all come about? And, you know, did you know that you wanted to be a coach? Uh, I didn't. I actually started off as an athletic training major at Northeastern. Um, and I learned very quickly that that probably wasn't going to be for me after about my first year there. Um, so I got into psychology and I did kind of a focus in women's and sports psychology. And as I got towards the end of my career, and I would say probably about halfway through my senior year, um, Linda Lundrigan, who was a huge proponent for me getting into college coaching, um, she was our assistant coach and my assistant coach through all four years. I sat down with her and asked her what her thoughts were about me getting into coaching. Um, at that point in time, the CWHL was coming out. So it was kind of, you know, do I keep playing? Do I want to keep playing? Um, you know, I had had an attempt with the national team at one point in time. Do I want to keep pursuing? And, you know, I had a really great conversation with her that really sparked my interest getting into coaching. And I kind of the passions just continued to grow every year um, from there. Yeah, that's really cool. So you, you headed to SUNY, um, what was your first stop? I, SUNY Cortland. Yeah. SUNY Cortland, yeah. So I was, I was there's so many SUNY schools. I, I knew it was, <laughs> oh, yeah. was close. So you're assistant coach there at SUNY Cortland. Then you moved on as head coach at New England College. Um, yeah. and, and then from there, you went to coach in China. How was that? What, what was that about? You know what? Um, <laughs> it was interesting, especially coming off of my head coaching position. Um, I was the head coach of our junior U18 team, but then when we went to the world championships, I was one of the assistant coaches under uh, Digit Murphy. And um, at those practices leading up to those months of worlds, it was, you think you know how to coach until you are coaching kids that cannot speak your language, you cannot speak their language, and hockey is the only language that you have in common. So we, it really pushed me as a coach to learn new techniques and ways of teaching um, I found like I started putting boards, extra mini boards on the bench with extra markers. So the girls, because we had some girls that could speak English and some that couldn't, um, and some that could speak Chinese and some that couldn't. So we put mini boards for them. So if they got back from a shift and they wanted to communicate but didn't know how, they'd you know start using that to talk to each other and draw things out. Um, so we definitely we we had to get creative. Uh, Carrie Cohen was with us on that adventure as well. So we, her and I definitely lived through a lot together, but it was, I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was a great experience. It definitely made me a better coach. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, I, I've been over to China a couple of times and I've felt the same way. You, you had to change the way you coached and it made you a better coach. You became Absolutely. a desi designer of the practice and yep. trying to design stuff that they can get out and kind of the stuff that Dean Trelars and Stuart Armstrong and all the people in the past webinars were talking about was, Absolutely. you know, you, you were, that was your, that, that's like a, that was tough. So um, uh, from there, you went from China and then you came to Lindenwood um, University. Uh, yeah, I was with the Boston Shamrocks, a junior girls team for about a year and a half, uh, which was a great experience. Um, you know, youth hockey, I, I'm with the New England district as the director of girls player development right now. So Youth, uh, youth hockey and that development side has always been a passion. So I was fortunate enough to work there for a year and a half. And then last August, I got a call from Coach Looney um, asking me to come on board here. And 
August 23rd was my first, I, I think I came out here on the 20th and my first day was the 23rd. So it was a, a pretty quick turnaround, but I'm very fortunate to, to be here and it's been a great experience so far. So, so when you came back from China and started working with uh, athletes that actually could understand your, your language, yeah. what, what changed for you? What, what was, you know, anything in particular that changed? In your, um, I, think, coach? I think I became way more purposeful in what I was teaching and how I was teaching it. Um, I think it's super easy for coaches to get caught up in, um, you know, this is something basic, so you should understand what I'm saying. So we almost shorthand it with people and with our athletes. And I think what I found was simplifying and using, you know, one of the things I always keep in the back of my mind is, you know, the three, three key things that I want to hit on during this drill or during this situation. Um, and I, I did that with our Chinese players. And right when I came back, I, I tried to do the same thing, you know, no matter what level I'm coaching at, I think athletes appreciate it. The simplicity makes it easier for them to understand. Um, but I think the more purposeful and cognizant you are of, what you're saying and how you're saying it to them uh, is super important. I think they appreciate it because they understand, you know, that there's care behind it and there's a purpose behind it. It's almost like a, uh, how many letters you can write on Twitter, right? You got to like yeah. be pers purposeful on, on what it is. And exactly, and, you know, I, I think that's a, a good message that we can give all our coaches, no matter what age. And, you know, your experience of being over in China and having to go through this, you know, and then coming back, I think just makes everybody a, a better coach. That's awesome. I, I really yeah, like and it, I, I will say it definitely makes me appreciate the uh, the skill of the players that I've been fortunate to coach too, because it's and the depth. I mean, I think sometimes as coaches here in the U.S. or even in Canada, there's uh, you kind of take for granted the uh, the athletes that you have in front of you. So um, you know, I definitely it makes me more thankful every day to work with the, the athletes that I have and the drive that they have. It's it's awesome. Yeah, and uh, let's talk about a little bit about developing or director of girls player development in new england district and yeah. you know we're going to talk about body contact today you know where does and you touch briefly touched on it where does that fit in in the, in the women's game you know in the contact checking yeah you know it's we obviously there's no checking allowed in women's hockey uh, but i think anyone who's watched an olympic game or a national level game knows that there's contact i mean even even during our games you know at the highest ncaa level there's absolutely contact. Um, and I think what I've learned, you know, with the New England district, I've also been fortunate enough to help run the uh, 14s Eastern Select Camp, which is like a mini national camp for the Eastern Seaborne districts. And some of those clips I'll actually be using today from camp. And, you know, what we found is even those girls that are coming in at 13, almost 14 years old, some of these basic skill sets within that competitive contact and body contact have just haven't been taught to them. So as they get older, you're kind of playing a catch up. Um, so that's one thing that we've tried at all of our, you know, district camps and within the 14s camp um, and really pushed to a lot of those club coaches out in the district is make sure that this is something that you're teaching as often as possible. And it, honestly, I think as young as possible, because there's simple ways to get get players comfortable with how they use their body, their edges. Um, and I think the sooner that you get them in that situation and in that position, the more that they can create that confidence and you know, be able to compete at that higher level. Um, I just, you know, I think about my time at national camp or at multi-district camps and the amount of times that we've had to adjust practice plans because there's just certain girls from different areas that just haven't had the opportunity to learn any of the basics. Um, and and that, shouldn't, that shouldn't be a gap that we have to deal with. Um, I think hockey's hockey at the end of the day and just because there's a rule difference doesn't mean that there's necessarily not that contact that's happening. Yeah, that's... Uh... Awesome. I, I, I love, you know, like you put it so perfect in terms of body contact is body contact, doesn't matter what age. And, you know, it's important that we're doing it very early. And um, sure. for those of you that, that don't know, we have actually a check in the right way um, manual on our website. It's free and we give it out to all our in, in person clinics. Um, so if you have any questions or more information, you can just check it out. It's actually on usahockey.com slash declaration. You can find a lot of the stuff there. So um, unless, Kristen, you have any other questions for Christy, I think this might be a perfect time to dive into the skill, the timing, the purpose. Love it. I think that's a great segue, Dave. I've, I'm excited to see what Christy has for us today on teaching this really important skill. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, you know, I know during this time with uh, COVID and a pandemic, it's, it's not easy as players, athletes, and coaches to be stuck inside. 
Um, you know, I know as coaches, we've been fortunate enough for USA Hockey to put these webinars on. Um, I know there's other opportunities out there too. And I think it's kind of forced us to take a step back and be able to finally work on us as coaches. So it's been great to watch and take little things here and there from other people. So um, I appreciate you guys having me on. I am gonna be doing sort of a weatherly um, presentation today. I feel like with the video, this made the most sense and hopefully it'll come out clear for you guys. But uh, you know, we talk, we're gonna talk today about the skill, the timing and the purpose behind body contact. Um, you know, there's really with body contact and competitive contact, those are pretty interchangeable because at the end of the day, you know, you're competing for that puck. So what I'm going to do, I have two clips here that I want to show for you guys just to kind of introduce what we're going to be talking about. One's going to show that body contact, that initiating battling for the puck um, and hopefully winning that puck. And then the second one talking about angling. Um, you're going to see number 24 here coming in nice and patient, waiting for that puck to get pulled out, initiate some contact and makes a great job executing, getting the puck up the ice. Um, you know, we'll talk about the skills that go within that, but I think there's so much importance behind getting players to understand, um, you know, we're not just going in to hit to hit or to contact to engage. We're going in with a purpose, right? And we want, at the end of the day, we want that puck back. Next clip, number 24 here again, talking about angles. When we talk about angles, say this is probably the epitome of what most of us think of as coaches with an angle, getting your speed going around, going, leading with that stick, stick on puck and driving through hips through hands and gaining possession of that puck. Um, you know, I think there's different areas of the ice that this can definitely happen, but to, you know, as we get further in, we'll start to dissect a little bit, you know, what, what goes behind that? What are the ways that we can get creative with it? So first, you know, I keep saying body com competitive contact. Um, you know, what is that? It's legal contact that occurs when a player is focused, when players too are focused on gaining and maintaining possession of the puck. One of the things you're going to hear me talk about is possession of the puck. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of saying possession doesn't necessarily mean pucks on your stick. Sometimes it's where's the puck located in relation to our body. So as we talk about the offensive and defensive side of body contact, I'll get into that a little bit more, but you're going to hear that. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. So, so uh, you put competitive contact. I know that was a big thing that we talked about um, or had in the declaration. And if you don't know the declaration, we put it out last June, it was approved by our executive board. And it kind of just specified exactly, you know, what is contact, what is body contact and um, the competitive part of it, I think it's a big thing to kind of, you know, make sure that we understand because yep. in our sport, right? Everything is competitive for the Absolutely. puck. And um, we just want to, you know, that body contact sometimes got hazy, but I think it's that competitive battle for that puck is, is the important part. So I think you hit it right, right. Perfect. But just want to kind of point oh, that out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and again, at the bottom, I put competing for that puck. It's the battle, right? We don't just want our athletes to engage in a battle along the boards or in open ice and come out empty handed, right? The end goal and the purpose behind that is we're trying to gain possession of that puck. So why is it important? I talked about this a little bit um, when we were doing our Q and A at the beginning, but the difference between, you know, body contact and body checking, you know, let's talk about that for a second. Body checking, we usually have that over hip, shoulder, um, forearm extension to create some sort of hit and contact. And I know, um, and Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that within body checking and the teachings behind that, um, there's been a big push to, again, talk about that competitive piece. It's not just about the hit, it's about gaining possession of that puck and creating the hit for the battle to gain possession of that puck. So I think even though body checking, body contact, or competitive contact, they're both different, right? There's still that end game of gaining possession of that puck. But today, again, talking about that body contact, competitive contact, um, I think there's three important pieces along lines of the body contact and competitive contact, right? Number one, body confidence. You're going to hear me talk about that a lot today. Um, I'm a big believer in confidence in general and building, <laughs> building confidence in young athletes early. And I think within contact, body confidence is huge, right? getting somebody comfortable leaning in, using their edges um, and understanding, you know, where do I need to be? What kind of stance do I need to be in in order to take a hit or in order to give a hit or in order to push somebody off into the boards to gain possession of that puck? What do I need to do? So the sooner that we can put somebody in that position, the better. Uh, the uh, second piece is understanding those roles. I touched on it before, but the offensive side of the puck, defensive side of the puck. I think 
so many times in body contact, we think of angling and think of a defensive side, trying to take away possession of that puck or trying to battle out and get possession back. What are we teaching our athletes that have possession of the puck? How are we teaching them to protect themselves, protect the puck, um, all important things. And I touched on a little bit, but third thing, angling. How are we angling? How are we teaching angling? What goes along with it? Are we steering with our stick? Are we taking away time and space? Are we finishing and, and finishing our, our angle all the way through to gain possession of that puck? So touching on that offensive uh, player with the puck, right? I wanna talk about the offensive side first, body positioning, that athletic stance, right? Where are we? Are we standing straight up when we're receiving that hit and we're gonna get knocked off balance or are we nice and low with a good knee bend? Looking athletic, right? Look and feel athletic. Um, puck positioning relation, in relation to the body. Right. If I know that somebody's coming at me from this direction, am I moving that puck to my outside hip to my left, or am I keeping it out there for them to be able to come in and try and take it? Am I turning my body and keeping my body between the puck and that player? Right. And then lastly, am I maintaining possession of that puck? And then thinking about the defensive player, right? They're trying to regain possession of that puck. Right. So are they leading with their stick as they're coming in and engaging? Are they taking that stick and using it to steer the person where they want them to go? They may not be taking a full ice angle, but are they taking away that time and space having an active stick, going stick on puck, right? And then thinking about angling and spatial awareness. The reason I put that spatial awareness in there, I think it's so important. And you'll see in the next clip that I show um, using a clip of Connor McDavid, but I think it's so important to understand that I could go in thinking that I'm going to angle somebody off, but if I'm taking away space from them on one side, but I'm still giving them three other options, am I really doing my job? Am I taking care of what I'm trying to do in limiting their options and getting that puck back, right? So teaching our athletes, like what other options do they have? Who's around? And I think that can kind of go hand in hand with the offensive side too. But, you know, talking about angling, leading with that stick, I said it before, but going stick on puck, hands through hands, hip, hips on hands. Um, and then again, let's, um, let's talk about that, the stick yeah. on puck piece. Cause even though this is competitive contact in our declaration yeah. of player safety, we've changed kind of the mentality of making sure our players are leading with their sticks, yeah. uh, hands down, keeping that contact away from the other player's head. Um, yeah. how do you make sure your players understand that that's so important? What do you incentivize them with? Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, what we talk about, um, especially when we're doing angling with our athletes is. Um, and I've used it with younger players, like younger kids too, but talking about if, if your stick's in the air or your stick's behind you and you're not leading with your stick, why are you going in with the stick in the first place? Because at the end of the day, you're not going to get anything out of it, right? We've been talking this whole time about it's a battle with the finish wanting to be gaining possession of that puck. If you don't have your stick out in front and you don't know where that puck is, how are you going to gain possession of that puck? If, if you don't have your stick in your hands or the pucks, the sticks in the air, you're, I mean, reality is you're not getting that, that puck back. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's yep. head on what we're trying to teach kids and teach coaches how to teach. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and, then, and back, back yep. when the NHL was still playing, we, if you really went and watched that game and you watched, I mean, you'll see on this clip and how many times your stick is on puck and they're really trying to have that focus that's an important part. And coach Hopper said it last week, you know, on, you know, focusing on the stick on the puck as well. And that's a major focus by the elite elite. And it yep. should be a major focus for our, you know, youth uh, and Absolutely. our eight year olds and our nine year olds and, and above. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's huge in just manipulating the situation. I know for us, you know, we talk a lot, a lot about having our, like when I work with the defenseman, I'm talking with them about what, if you were a forward, what would your option options be right now? And I think getting players to understand both sides of the game, not just because they may be in that situation one day, but to understand how do I manipulate the situation in order to get the puck back, that stick's not on, on the puck. You know, how are you going to give the illusion that you're there? Even if you might be away, but you're starting to encroach on that space, if that stick's on, on puck, you start to give that illusion that, hey, I'm, I'm, right, I'm right there and I'm about to get that puck back. All right, so I'm going to show that clip of, of McDavid that I was talking about. Um, it's going to re replay a couple of times here, but he just took the face off going down low, nudges his center that's guarding him, 
and gains possession of that puck. And you can see from overhead here, it's just a little nudge, creates enough space for himself to walk out and make that pass. Um, I think that's a little play that obviously turned into a big thing. And it's something that we don't think about enough. He, he knows that that puck's gonna get rimmed down to him. Um, and he knew that that space was open to the right behind the net. So he just created enough space for himself to be able to walk through. That puck didn't even get on his stick until about halfway through behind the net there, right? And then he walks out and makes a beautiful pass. Um, you know, I'm going to pause it as we go in right here. I think talking about that defensive player, right? If you watch, I'll let the clip go through a couple of times, but if you watch, does a lot of great head checks. I love that. Um, but the one thing that he doesn't necessarily do, he's so focused on where that puck is that he doesn't pay attention to what he's giving Connor, right? If I had my way, I'd love for him to be able to come in and take away that space behind the net and force him into traffic up the boards. Um, but he doesn't do that. Unfortunately, he gives him all the opportunity to go either direction and Connor makes, obviously makes the most of it here. Um, you know, I think it's just really important to think about both sides of the play here, but I love that offensive piece where just that soft little nudge, that little piece of contact gets the defenseman knocked off, knocked off his feet and he's able to get through and make a great play. So now talking about creating that body confidence, right? This, uh, these next couple of slides are gonna be a series of different drills that we've done at camp. Um, the, this one and the next one are actually the same station that were builders on, on each other. So it was about an eight minute station. We did two or three minutes in the first one that I'm gonna show you and then a couple of minutes in the next one. Um, different ways of creating some engagement between players and gaining that confidence. So you'll see here, we've got players paired off. They're gonna go side by side. You can have two players here that are opposite of each other. You're gonna go skate to skate, knee to knee, shoulder to shoulder, and just getting used to those edges and leaning against each other. I love this drill. This is again at our 14th Eastern Select Camp, Eastern Select Camp. Um, but I love this drill even for the younger ages. It's fun. What little, what, what eight to 10 year olds don't want to be sitting there nudging against each other and hitting each other, right? And getting used, getting comfortable pushing. But being able to get them to engage and just, like I said, get comfortable with their edges is super important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a great drill you can do on or off the ice. There's uh, on our mobile app, and I know I'm kind of trying to promote some of the stuff. There's so many resources that we have and some videos that you can do all of this. So you can see it on Christie's, but I know she's going to have a couple other ones that you can just check on our usahockey.com slash off ice or dryland. I'm sorry, usahockey.com slash dryland. But this can be awesome. on or off ice. This is great, great stuff. Yep. Thank you. Right. And then moving from that, I called this one the escape room. Um, I just trying to keep it relevant with the times. A lot of people go into escape rooms now, but um, basically what's going to happen here is we're going to have. We froze there for a second. Did we get it? There we go. Sorry, I have a little techno technical difficulty. I'll keep talking about it while I get it popped back up. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna have somebody, just gotta reconnect here. We're gonna have somebody starting off on the dot and then off of the dot, around the dot's gonna be a circle of players. You can have it as tight or as short spaced as you'd like. Okay, uh, with the younger kids, I recommend starting a little bit tighter in. They're not gonna have their six in hands. And what's actually gonna happen is that they're gonna end up, um, that player in the middle is trying to escape out of the dot, right? So they're trying to break that circle and those players on the outside, getting low athletic stance, trying to escape outside the circle. The older your players are, the more, the bigger you want that circle to be. So that way it's tougher for them to have to move, use their edges and get around. So, so Christy, you yeah. set that up. I'm going to ask Kristen a question or two, okay. and then we can uh, work from there. So, Kristen, when you are working with these athletes at this 14, in you're working at the national camp and other district camps, you know, how often do you see that these athletes are doing off ice um, body contact stuff off the ice? Very rarely. Uh, you know, we have some, like you said, really good materials of off ice body contacts, which, which really puts those younger kids on the same level without them being on the ice, having to worry about their edges. That's a great progression into the on ice, but we don't see enough, especially on the girls side of kids who are doing body contact off the ice to not only gain that confidence, but build that athleticism that Christy's talking about. So we'd love to see more programs doing it on a regular basis. Once a week, 15 minutes, that's all we're asking just right before or after practice. 
uh, put them in their equipment, everything except for their skates. So they've got tennis shoes on, all their equipment, helmets, and you can go out there and do shoulder bumps. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty awesome. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think that's an important part for, you know, any age group, but you especially have a good handful of the ones that are coming from 13 hockey up until 14 that that checking really starts girls or boys. So Chris, are you good? Guys, I appreciate you guys covering <laughs> for me. You know, I, I tested this thing about 18 times and it was perfect each time except for now. So that's it was bound to happen, though. So we're back in action here. All right. The skate room. Just wanted to zoom in quickly before playing, just so you guys see, we've got our player here that's in the middle starting on the dot. Um, I actually think it's funny in this video because the harder the girls on the outside felt like it was, the closer and more in tight they, came, they became. Um, so, you know, drawing a circle on the outside, getting creative in that way is definitely something you can do. Um, but I'll go ahead and play it here so you guys can see just how it happens. But you'll see on the whistle, they start far away. And then all of a sudden this girl tries to get out. Now we all just go in and try to, you know, take away that time and space. Um, so one of the things that we really tried to emphasize was short shift here, about 10 seconds, but the coaches were really doing a great job of making sure if they got in tight like that, they blow the whistle, pull the girls out, make sure that they didn't have that opportunity. A couple add-ons to this is having the outside group actually facing away. So everyone's facing the outside. And then as the whistle blows and the girl in the middle is trying to escape or the player in the middle, everyone has to turn around and now they have to read and react to where this girl's trying to go. Um, so not only are they working together, but I mean, individually, they got to stay strong and make sure they're getting well. This next one is a fun one. I actually dedicate this one to American Gladiator. Great show from back in the 90s, if anybody remembers. Um, but what we did was we took a bucket and we put it on the center dot or the face off dot. And we have the play defensive players starting with the ball. Right. So we gave our, our girl football. So that's why we called it uh, Gladiator football. Everyone else is outside the circle. So if you're working with a younger age group, this would be something perfect to do and just draw a smaller circle on the inside. So that way it's a, a little bit of a shorter space and distance for them to work with. Um, but one of the reasons I love this drill is that spatial awareness for the person that ends up catching the ball and the defensive player. They have to figure out how far out can I come to take away that space from you and attack and engage, but not giving you the opportunity to get burned past me. Right, so you'll see here, um, these two get into a really good battle as the ball gets thrown out. And now you get nice and low. Obviously, we're teaching not using our hands too much or shoving through, but getting low. You see whites really having to use their edges, reds having to get creative, putting the ball through. So we allowed them to go through the first couple of rounds, battling it out, even if it was 10, 15 seconds. Um, the add-on to this that we did was when the coach blew the whistle, that person that had the ball, if they didn't score yet, they had to throw to somebody else. So now they're out. So that red player would be out. And now white, that defensive player, has to play from that new person that got the ball. So they need to turn, read, and react to what's going on next. So a lot of different tweaks and add-ons that you can do to this. But you'll actually see as we start getting more into angling, a lot of this starts to come into play as we talk about reading and reacting to that puck and taking away time and space. Yeah, and uh, Coach uh, Kehoe, I'm sure that you could add – having a puck and make it actually a puck and then having stick yep. on puck, you know, like that's a progression. I think it's very good Absolutely. for, you know, that contact confidence and getting used to it in your edges. Yep. And also it's skating. It's, yeah. it's a skate, it's skating, it's edges. It's, exactly. you know, they, it's, they have... it's funny with our, uh, our volunteer coaches, what we had during when we were trying to teach them that drill, a lot of them were getting excited and getting, they're like, can we demo it? Every, everybody wanted to demo it, but then we would end up having nobody for the stations. Uh, to teach them. So it was, it was funny at, at any age, you know, I think really the contact just makes it more exciting. The more you, the more you teach it, the more you find ways to keep everyone engaged. It's, it's funny to see the smiles that kids have and they, when they finally figure it out, that aha moment is huge. So this is a, an add on piece to that body confidence that we were talking about where the kids start side by side. So we're going to have two players starting side by side here and they react to that puck getting pushed along the boards. And now in open space, players have to get used to reacting and leaning into each other and creating kind of like that McDavid clip where he had to create some space for himself, right? Now they have to get into a puck battle for it. So what we did, the first layer was just, if you win the puck, you skate it back to line, you win. The next layer beyond that was you had two puck or uh, either two pucks, two tires, two cones, whatever you want to use. And now Let's say player one gets the puck, but if I battle out and I get that puck back from her, I can still take it back to my cone and I win, 
Um, in a couple, I think it's the next slide here, we'll actually end up adding in a goalie, but one more clip just to show you how it happens. Again, you know, it's especially with the younger ages, you start to see a big size difference between um, athletes. And I think a lot of coaches shy away from that. I think one of the biggest things to understand is especially in women's hockey. I mean, I've got a six foot kid on my team and we've got a five foot kid on our team. So that size difference is always going to be there. And I think for the longest time, coaches have used that kind of as an excuse of not wanting to put people in bad situations. And the reality is you're not putting them in a tough situation. You got to teach them how to work through that and how to use their bodies. Um, so on to the next one here, one-on-one -on -one battles. So what we did was we put a net in the corner. We've got two players starting in front of the net facing the coach, similar to the last one. Coach is going to dump a puck to either side, and now they're just going to play it out. They're going to play some hockey with that end goal, putting the puck in the net. Um, first person to get the puck and gain possession of the puck is trying to score. That defensive player is trying to get that puck and pass it back to the coach. Um, couple add-ons that we have done of this was a defensive player having the opportunity to pass it to the last player in each line. So that way it's almost like two outlets on the breakout. Um, the offensive player getting to add a person. So you can add it into two on one. You can make it a two on two. Um, a, lot of, a lot of different tweaks that you can make to it. But, um, you know, as far as building and making sure that you're adding in layers and, and giving the players a chance to grow, succeed, fail, grow, succeed, fail, and you kind of get them back and forth on putting them in situations where they get to really test themselves on how well they do. So, so you're bound to have penalties or yep. the, yep. the girls, your athletes having penalties. How do you deal with that? And how do you use it as a teaching moment for your athletes? Like, what do you do as a coach for that? Yeah, I or think a lot in practice. Things, yeah, um, I think what we do is we kind of break down what happened. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, sometimes it's just dropping that shoulder too much. There might be too much extension. Um, obviously, video is great. So for us, we go back and look at penalties that happened in games and we'll show our players, hey, listen, here's here's what happened. Like, you know, you gave a little bit too much extension on there because a lot of times, and I know I probably did it as a player too, in the moment, you're like, oh, that was a beautiful angle. It was, it was everything, everything you've always asked me to do. And the reality, oh, did I actually push my hands all the way through? I missed that part, right? We, we They kind of forget what's happening in the moment. So to be able to take a step back and talk them through and ask them, what were they doing and why? Um, I think gets them thinking and reflecting on, okay, what did I do? What actually just happened? How could I change it? Um, it's more of a conversation, I think, than, than anything else. And Kiho, sometimes um, with the, especially with the older age groups, once you're trying to teach them to be responsible in those situations, yep. when we keep score during small area games, Sometimes we'll even give a point to the other team if a team takes a penalty before, and then we'll talk through it with the player. Just at yep. that older ages to get them to recognize that team element to, you know, to absolutely penalties or especially stupid, dangerous penalties. Yeah, I love that. Um, one of the things that we also do in our small games is we've actually, to allow our girls to gain some confidence with the pressure being on them. Um, I've, I think I inherently became the ref. I don't think I meant to do it, but it just kind of happened throughout the season. But if I see a penalty or one that's like, especially a hit, that's kind of extreme. What I'll do is I'll blow the whistle and that, that person that uh, was kind of like was fouled on um, actually gets a sh like a breakaway shot or a penalty shot on net. So it kind of, it allows them the opportunity to gain that extra point. But um, I think one thing is kind of getting players used to having that pressure on them. So that's why we decided to do that, but love that idea, Kristen. Yeah, because I think it's really important for our players to understand what is a penalty and what's not in practice. Yep. And I think us as coaches, and I was a, a probably, I did it too. I let too many penalties go, whether it's a stick infraction or whatever. I think it's, it's important for us to know the rules, you know, yep. and keep on knowing the rules. And that's how we're going to enforce it in games. Because we don't know sometimes, you know, the ref's going to call it, not going to call it. But we want to have that kind of very strict base that our players know hey, this is a penalty, you know, and this is Absolutely. this is what should be called. So I think that's an important part. For sure, for sure. Uh, next one here. So I talked at the beginning about how understanding that angling and contact happens in different areas of the ice. So what we did was we put two buckets out and there's actually two lines on either side of the puck right now. Um, and when they are allowed to leave at the same time, there's no whistle, they leave on their own. They're gonna come in and skate around the buckets and coach is going to throw a puck out. Um, unfortunately, this was the only video of the drill, so that's why I threw it in there. But 
these girls didn't necessarily engage as much as I wanted them to. Um, but the nice thing about having the boards in the back is obviously it's a backboard. So that puck goes behind them and they compete it out and play it out until the whistle's blown. So again, like I said, puck gets, gets right past them. Um, but one of the reasons that we created this drill and put it together was getting players used to, you know, how many times in the neutral zone have you had a collision in games or how many times have players been going through and they stop before somebody can hit them. And um, we're not trying to get them to obviously, you know, go through and wreck somebody, but we want them to get used to when they come in, giving a little bump and being able to stop while gaining possession of that puck. Both these players are kind of focused on just the puck alone. Um, but, you know, different ways to be able to do this would be adding in a net. So depending on who gets it, they're able to just go in and it's a one-on-one -on -one battle to score, do it in different areas of the ice. Um, you can make it once the player gets the puck, add a person, go two-on-one, two-on-two, lots of different ways to be able to do it. Uh, I talked about this uh, in the Q&A at the beginning with you guys, but being purposeful in what we coach and why. Um, I, I have said it and I'll keep repeating it. I don't think it's ever too early to teach body confidence to your players. Talked about off ice and doing it on ice as well. A lot of these drills um, that we're doing that, you know, national level players are doing, that NHL players are doing, they're simple. They're simple little things to get, to just get that, mu that muscle memory down. And I think the earlier that you can do it with your athletes, the better. Um, you know, teaching them that athletic stance, getting them to understand and get comfortable with giving and taking because there are those two sides. Um, I think there's a lot of hesitation that unfortunately does lead to injury. Um, and obviously players start at different times. So you may have a player that's been playing for five years that comes in and is playing with a player that has been playing for two. Um, at the end of the day, I think as coaches, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're teaching them how to engage and engage properly. Um, now I'm gonna get into angling for a little bit here, talking about that good stick good speed and patience and understanding that spatial awareness. Where are we on the ice? What are we taking away? Play this really quickly. I showed this at the beginning, but again, textbook, open ice angle, keeping your speed going, stick on puck all the way through and then battling through for that puck. Um, that was not a penalty. I know some people are probably gonna ask that question, but uh, was was a clean battle along the boards. Um, that was our six foot Jada Burke that won the battle on that puck. And then another clip, uh, looking at it from the defensive end, a D playing in the corner, you know, I think um, that skill of angling is just as important as that open ice angling and being able to maintain that speed because we're talking about containing our players and containing that puck. So number 22 is containing for a loose puck down there and waits for the right time to engage, force a loose puck and try to gain possession back for the team. A um, couple of drills we're going to go through here from national camp. So I thank Kristen for helping me out with this. Um, first one here is clock angling. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna have the red player down low, is gonna start off with the puck. The player opposite of her is gonna end up coming in and angling, taking away either direction, forcing her to make a pass. You see, we have four lines here. So this actually ends up turning into a continuous drill. I'll go ahead and play it through while I continue talking. Um, as that puck moves, right, the opposite player has to engage and interact. Um, as a warm-up drill, I think this is great. Uh, as, as a coach, our responsibility to make sure that kids aren't getting lazy, right? So that number 18 that just went through just took a beeline right, <laughs> right to the next line. So really making sure, again, not something that you have to be going full speed through being a warm-up drill, but making sure that we're getting that proper lean down, taking away that space. Our stick is a great manipulation tool, especially defensively. So to be able to force somebody and take away that time and space and take a good deep angle to be able to force that pass or force the puck to move, I think is huge. Yeah, and Christy, that's another one that uh, we recommend coaches do off ice as well. You could do it with yep. in a street ball, or you can even do it with a, you know, like a dodge ball and they toss it just to get them working on what it means to force that player up the side that you want them to. Yep. Absolutely. I love that. So next one, defend the dot. So Dave talked about adding in a puck, trying to get that person to attack and get that puck to the dot. So this is kind of that next level. We've got four lines down below and up top. We've got one player defending the dot here. I'm going to let it keep playing through while I talk. Um, we're going to have a puck move east to west. Once that player receives it, their job is to attack that, that dot. Um, defending player, we want them to have good feet, taking away that time and space. Offensive player, talking about both sides of the puck, 
have to make sure we're not putting that puck out in front for somebody to be able to just take it away, right? Talk to your players and athletes about protecting that puck, getting it on the outside of the hip, using your body to be that shield, getting nice and low, trying to drive through. Um, it, what I love that these coaches did here was they really let these players play it out. So a couple of times that puck gets up along the boards or they let them get a little bit gritty. I love that. That gives the players kind of that, that spice and that, that spunk and excitement to want to keep playing more. Another angling drill shot into an angle. We've got two different pads going here. You've got a low pad and a high pad. Player's just going to walk out and shoot. You've got the second player curling out. Here's a nice check, just so we understand the difference between checking and, and angling there. Uh, but love this drill because this is something, again, you can do after you do it with the boards, flip, have the pads to the inside, and now we're cutting into open space. Um, making sure that you are getting your athletes boards time as much as on uh, open ice time, I think is huge when it comes to angling because you want to make sure that you're giving them the opportunity because they're going to have that happen in the game. Right. You want to give them the confidence just as much along the boards as you can down low. Uh, the next point that I was going to make was being able to shrink that space. Obviously, with the older kids, it was a little bit more spread out. Now we've shrunk that space, still allowing that shot and these young players to be able to react, giving them time to come up and make a good angle. Um, but even just shrinking that space, the difference that it can make for young kids still getting that same opportunity, I think, is huge. Christy, what age would you have kids start doing these drills at? Uh, I think it all depends on the level of play that you have. Um, I'm a big learn to walk before you learn to run. So, I mean, um, I also don't want to go against ADM here, but I would say the sooner you can get kids angling, the better, like I 10, 12 years old, if you can get them into these situations, I think is huge. I mean, 10, 10 would probably be the, the time that I would say I want them to get into this because at that eight year, they should be as confident as can be with their bodies ready to come in and, and start moving. Absolutely. Yeah. Starting at 10 U, uh, getting them to experience these drills, these situations will just make them, you know, better as they get older. Uh, yep. so yeah, absolutely starting at 10 U with any of these. Awesome. And, and what does it look like? It, it's a race, right? Like, and you can kind of sell it, uh, to your athletes a couple of different ways. Hey, we're racing for a puck where, yep. you know, and you can put a, a, a bigger, um, point value for doing something that you want to try to get. If you got stick on puck and you get it with your stick, you know, if somebody else has a puck, guess what? You get an extra point. And that's Absolutely. what we're teaching. We're, we're trying to help that way. So, yeah. Absolutely. And then last one here, um, more of an expanded version of the same drill, but instead of having those pads and cones out there, which we use cones as a guide just for the first couple of reps, we actually took them away after. Same concept with two nuts at each side. So it's going to be continuous back to back. But we're going to have one player start here. She's going to walk out and shoot. She's got to get up the ice and get ready to angle. The second player who's picking up a puck off the boards down here. So now we're adding in extra elements where they're picking up those loose pucks off the boards. They're having to make sure that they gain possession before they start moving their feet. Um, there we go. It's playing here. All right. So you see that player. Oh. While you're getting that to play, I mean, I love yes. that you have this set up in the end zone. Uh, similar, we were just talking about, you know, playing 10U, doing angling drills, body contact at 10U, but it's also important that cross eye space that we're playing with 8U and younger, you know, really takes away time and space and uh, involves more body contact, more bumping at the youngest age levels as well. So, yep. you know, we want them to have that at 8U. And that's one of the reasons that we've implemented the cross ice at 8U is so that a, it's more game-like for them, but also it'll increase their, their contact confidence even at that youngest age levels. Absolutely. So now we got it playing. Thank you for that. So you see, I'll have this loop through again. I believe it's going to end up looping through. No, nope. I'll click it again. There we go. So as that player comes out and shoots the puck, it's her responsibility to get up the ice. Um, one of the biggest reasons why we say as the girls get older to take away those cones is put them in a situation where they have to think oh man, did I take too far of an angle? Did I go too low? Do I have to play catch up with my speed? Um, it gives them that opportunity to now go through those processes from the defensive side. And then again, from the offensive side, did I pick up a puck? Did I take a good enough angle to get the puck? Am I slowing down? Do I need to gain some speed? Um, I'm a big, 
big fan of allowing that opportunity to cut back and not saying you just go along the boards because never in a game would I want my player to just go along the boards if they have that option to cut to the middle of the ice. And last one here. Um, I honestly do not remember what the name, I think this was urgency two on one, if I remember correctly here. Um, but what's going to happen is we had three players of red on one side, three blue on the other, two that don't have pucks from each team and one that does. The player that does have the puck is actually going to turn out to be the defensive player should the two offensive players come in and get the puck back the way they should. They're, the two players without pucks are going to actually cross sides. So red's going to come over here and try to pressure, contain, get the puck back, regain possession, get a good shot on net. Two blue players are coming down this way to do the same thing. Um, I love this drill because this is something, again, for younger players, you could totally twist this and turn it into a drill for them. Putting the nets back to back on the dots here, cutting the space down. You could even start it off by making it, you know, one person, two on two, having one person from each side going without a puck um, instead of two on one or even, sorry, excuse me, making it one on one. Um, so lots of ways to get creative. I, I think that's the biggest thing. If I had a piece of advice, whether it was teaching body contact or anything, is don't be afraid to get creative with your drills um, and think a little bit outside of the box on what you can do. I think we all get so comfortable with what, you know, drills that we've learned in our time. And I think if you learn to tweak things a little bit here and there, you'll start to see that more, more athletes uh, get engaged and are, are involved. So I think that concludes what I have for you guys. I don't Thanks know if there's one question. Yeah. You talked yeah. a lot. A lot of your drills had an offensive player and a defensive player, and they yeah. had, you know, specific goals. Like the offensive player was trying to score. The defensive yeah. player needed to make a pass or carry the puck to the tire. Yeah. Uh, why have you implemented that transition into your drills? Um, I think the biggest piece is making it game like, right? If if I've if we've got our players, um, you know, whether if they're a defensive player without the puck and they're in the D zone, neutral zone, even offensive zone for checking, um, you know, if they're for checking and they get the puck back, we want them to go score, right? Or in the defensive zone, we get the puck. We're, we want that puck moving quickly so we can transition and get out. And I think on the flip side, the offensive player with that puck, I mean, what coach doesn't want pucks to the net and what coach doesn't want players putting pucks in the net. So um, I think putting that extra little pressure on them to make it game like it's not just for this one reason, Yes, here's our purpose behind it, but we all know here's the greater goal of what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's great. I mean, making sure our drills are game-like and the game has so much transition and again, it has specific roles is really helpful for our athletes to experience that during practice. For sure. So uh, Christy, I, I have a question about um, just the, the, uh, the angling that you're, you're talking about. So, yeah. and, and we know it's such an important part for any age, you know, and I think it's just essentially just getting the puck back. And for the angling, is there a specific thing that you're doing? Or, right, sorry, how often are you doing the angling in your drills at the college level per week? I mean, I think we try to include it in as much of what we're doing as possible. Um, we, we try to make our drills as multifaceted as possible. So if there's some sort of transition or a loose puck um, or you're doing one thing, then puck changes and now you're reacting to a new puck here. Um, I think putting your, your players in that situation at any level is, is huge because it's, I mean, again, like we showed everywhere on the ice, there's some sort of angling and contact happening um, at any level. So to, to make sure that we're, we're taking care of that and touching on it is, is really important. Yeah. I think that's an important, important aspect that, you know, everything of trying to get the puck back is an angle, you know, you're, yep. you're trying to have your stick and put him in a spot that you want and, uh, or the player, the defensive player wants in order to try to gain possession so that we can go play offense. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Offense there. Um, so, uh, through your experiences in, I want to kind of bring back China, okay? Because yeah. I think that's really super interesting of how, how you're coaching from there and how you're coaching those athletes. Yeah. Um, while you were there, was there any big difference that you saw in the athlete or the players to the players in the U.S.? Not the language, not yeah. whatever. Was there anything that you saw between those players? You know, I would, I would say those athletes were really disciplined. 
Um, that was one of the biggest things that I learned. They, you know, there wasn't a hesitation on what we were saying. It was what we said went right off the bat. That that respect was was there, um, and I think that's a huge cultural piece. They're used to respecting their elders, and and you know, having not that we don't necessarily have that here, but I just I just think their cultural differences within you know how do we how do we treat a coach or how do we treat somebody that is above us um I think was was one of the biggest things that I learned right off the bat I mean if if there was a player that didn't know how to do something and we worked with them on it they would keep doing it probably until they were forced off the ice because they wanted to make sure that they could achieve it and they could accomplish it that's, yeah that's interesting how about on the um what was your most favorite thing to do what did they like to do the most in your drills uh, or activities in practice? Was it small area games? Was it, um, what was it for them? Yeah, I mean, I have to say the small area games or any, anything that we made into like a competition, I think was, was so huge for them because they're very competitive. Um, to be able to give them that situation to, you know, think a little bit more. And, um, you know, I think for them, learning their edges and getting their feet underneath them was something that we worked a lot on. So to put them in those tight spaces where they had to move quickly um, and, and show their athleticism and, and compete was, was something that they really enjoyed. Yeah, I'm sure that was an easy thing for you to kind of implement and put in there for those, those players because in the end, you know, they're just looking to compete no matter if they're playing in China, they're playing in the U.S. or they're playing uh, for the, the country up north. It doesn't matter Absolutely. where, you know, like Absolutely. I think – you're going to get the most out of them if you can kind of design that drill or design that activity that will yep. make them compete and make them get pucks. And, you know, I think that's an important thing and less is more on the talking. Um, Kristen, do you have any other questions before we wrap it up? Yeah. I wanted to, Christy, you talked about very briefly in the drill with the, uh, the two kids that were coming straight at each other yep. about how you don't blow the whistle to start that drill. Yep. Talk a little bit about that and, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this game is hockey is a very great sport and there's a lot of reading and reacting. Um, so I think to give them the opportunity to react off of each other um, and what you don't tell them who's going first or who initiates it's, hey, you guys go off of each other and go. So if, player, if the blue player goes a little bit sooner than red, now red's got to catch up a little bit and get to it. And I mean, that's that's our game. It's reading and reacting and again, trying to win that battle for the puck. So putting them in that situation to have a little, not just control, but having to read and react off of it is huge. Yeah, that decision-making for athletes in practice. Uh, we talk yeah. a lot about that in our practice design and it's great that you implemented it into your drills. Uh, the other question, when we talk about teaching body contact confidence, um, how, I mean, puck placement in drills, how can coaches use um, loose pucks, new pucks, to help encourage or promote body contact? Yeah, I mean, again, getting them to think about and read and react to what's happening and creating some decision-making, um, you know, whether a puck goes out of play or you just want to freeze that puck and have them play a new one, you know, forcing them out of the situation that they were in and getting comfortable with to a new one and having to read and react, I think is, is huge. Yeah, a lot of times those loose puck battles being very intentional, if you want yep. those kids to learn to, pick up a puck off the boards and have that contact, you put the puck there, right? Or yep. you can do a close loose puck battle to simulate a face off, yep. uh, all those little things to make your practice game like, but also to get, you know, what you want out of your athletes with each thing. You know, you talked about being purposeful. So we talk about that with loose pucks as well. Absolutely. So uh, Christy, we have, we've been asking every presenter that's been on, um, if they were, went in a time machine and told the younger self of coach Christy Kehoe, oh, yeah. what, what would you tell your younger self? So you're just starting a SUNY Cortland or, you know, going for new England college. What would you tell that person? Ooh, number one, you don't know everything, even if you feel like you do. Right. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing was, you know, using, uh, I, I kind of said it at the beginning, but to have all these different webinars and different opportunities for coaches to learn from each other and interact with each other, I, I think is huge. Um, so that's, that's something that I definitely learned throughout the years is being able to use the people around you. Um, and then I think, you know, if I could have learned to be a little bit more purposeful 
in what I was doing from a, a younger coaching age, I think maybe a, it would have been a little, that much better for me. But um, I would I would say those two things were were the main points for me. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, using the people around you and having mentors and talking to them, no matter if you're a youth hockey coach or you know a high level coach like yourself at Lindenwood, doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, having having a mentor, or somebody to you know, challenge you, but also be there to support you. I think is super. Yeah. Important. I mean, we, if we all say it, right. We tell our athletes it all the time, but I think it's the same for us. If we're not hungry to learn and get better then you know, what's, what, what are we trying to do? So to be able to use each other is, is huge. And I, I talk to youth coaches all the time that I take little pieces from. And I think the fact that we're a nice community that can work together is, is awesome. That's, that's really cool. Kristen, do you have any last words before we uh, sign off here? No, that's all. Thank you so much, Christy, for your time. It was great to have you. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. And I have to give a shout out to our assistant coach, Greg Haney. He is the tech wizard and what helped me be able to figure all of this out. So I want to give a huge shout out to him because I am not a tech gal at all. That's so, awesome. Thanks, Greg. That, that's, <laughs> yeah. Good job, Greg. Um, <laughs> So I just want to thank everybody for watching USA Hockey webinar series presented by BioSteel and Pure Hockey. Uh, thanks for joining us. Tomorrow we have uh, Dr. Larry Lauer, and uh, he's a mental skills specialist. Um, and he has a, a young 12 and under kid and team that he works with as well. So he'll bring, you know, stuff that you can implement with your team right away um, because he's living that. So um, and then later this week, we have uh, Ted Monish for our goalie nation group crew on Thursday. And then on Friday, we have um, Norm McIver, who's assistant GM for the Chicago Blackouts. He's going to talk about his travels, his experiences, which are varied through the NHL, NCAA, but now at, on the front office side and working on developing, um, you know, he was part of three Stanley Cups. So really excited. Thanks again, Coach Kehoe. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, guys. And we will see you tomorrow at 3.30 p.m.